Please welcome uh, Barbara Eiden. It's not only National Tree Day, but it's also Leonard Cohen's birthday. <laughs> I didn't know whether to sing Suzanne this evening or just to go straight into my program. <laughs> but it was like a homecoming, sort of cruising around in the foyer there, and just to be with a group of like-minded people, I always get a little overly excited. And um, forgive me if I get too overly excited, but this is something I'm very passionate about. I just wish I knew 45 years ago when I started on this track what I know now. <laughs> I'm just trying to save a lot of people a lot of time and I was very fortunate I think in that as I was moving through career paths I could move very easily from the private sector to municipal government to the provincial government then I worked with the feds then I worked with the not-for-profit organizations, and I love that community of passionate people that aren't driven by profit, but are driven by a desire to do something for the public good. And um, now I'm trying to give back, and what you will be hearing tonight is a lot of law and policy stuff, and no one's allowed to fall asleep. It happened to me in my last presentation in Coburg, and the poor chap was right in the front row. And <laughs> there he was, out oh, cold. <laughs> um, it's hard to make it interesting and gripping, but it's absolutely imperative that you understand that trying to conserve nature and trying to protect big old trees, which are, tend to be viewed as a liability, a safety risk, um, a lot of people just don't have the knowledge or have gone through the peer-reviewed research that shows how important these trees are to communities, to defining a sense of place. They have more biodiversity. Big old tree has more of that biodiversity than acres of land. Um, they're extraordinary. And, and so once I learned to spell extraordinary right, I feel comfortable starting on this presentation. What I'd like to do is I'd like to talk a bit about how the province defines heritage trees. Um, there are certain uh, tricks to understanding what goes into uh, defining a heritage tree and that is prescribed by the legislation. We all love trees, but we also have to be cognizant of what the legislation accepts as a heritage tree. So we have ways of protecting them in Canada and specifically in Ontario. We also have ways of commemorating them. Two different things. Because a tree is recognized and commemorated doesn't mean it's protected, as we've discovered as some of our national historic sites have disappeared. But we do have ways uh, that trees can be protected. Not just trees, but hedgerows, windbreaks, alleys, orchards, trees on private property, trees on public property, what we call cultural heritage landscapes. These are natural areas that have been modified by humans and that has been recorded and they're valued for their uh, specific attributes. So defining heritage trees this is, these are some of the criteria that we've used. I don't quite know why this is <laughs> doing what it's doing, but, um, and these are ones I'm sure that have been in the back of your mind as being important. It's the size, the form, the shape, the beauty, the rarity of cultural interest. And I'll come back to that, cherished and recognized. This is a definition that was, these are the elements of a definition that uh, Dr. Paul Eric came up with, Professor Emeritus at the Forestry Department at the University of Toronto. And it's a very good definition. Okay. There are other criteria as well that, uh, let me just, I think, there are other criteria as well that if you actually want to protect a tree using the Ontario Heritage Act, 
that must meet certain criteria that are defined in Regulation 0906, which are regulations pursuant to the passing of the Ontario Heritage Act. And that, the key aspect there is these are the elements that define significant cultural heritage. And th this is what these elements are. Culture is man, something that's man-made, physical evidence of people's activities. We find that they're enriching, worth keeping and maintaining. We find them in built form. We find them in modified natural landscapes, which we often define as cultural heritage landscapes. We find them in archaeological deposits. They have historical significance. They have an emotion to us. They have spiritual value. They're often fragile. They all, always, I think, require a measure of recognition and stewardship. So why is cultural heritage important? I think you know this because this is the basis of, I think, people going out and taking the time to see those trees that had importance to them. They create a sense of place and identity. They could be unique to your area. They do benefit tourism, community branding, etc. And I'll show you booklets that the city of, for example, of Victoria has uh, published that you can take bicycle tours around the city of Victoria and meet the various cultural heritage trees that have been uh, recognized in the book. They enrich us and, and we share it and that's why we're all here this evening is because we know these things. So a heritage tree defined in the legislation and policies in Ontario has to have some sort of cultural association. So it has to be either in itself um, recognized as part of our culture or part of a larger landscape, such as a cemetery or a farmstead um, or associated with some significant building. Going through the regulations that are part of the Ontario Heritage Act, this is what the regulations say, that to be recognized as having heritage, it must have design value or physical value. So trees can be rare, unique, and this is wording from the regulations. Uh, they can be rare, unique, representative examples of a type which you translate into a natural terminology, i.e. a species, or an expression which translated into natural terminology would be a hedgerow, an alley, an orchard, etc. So trees can display a high degree of craftsmanship or artistic merit if they're integrated into a landscape or a part of the building. So someone has to go out and do some research, and you've probably done this in your extraordinary tree hunt, some research in the cultural value of the trees. And this is where it's quite interesting. Of course, we know um, the, the group of seven painted individual trees in the Algoma area. Or we can look at some of the historical atlases, and you'll see there a bird's eye view of a particular farmhouse, like my farmhouse, and the spruce trees. It used to be called spruce grove in those days. There is a little row of spruce trees. Um, in, in the historical atlas of 1878. These are tools, now they're online, it's brilliant. Um, but they're tools that are accessible to all of us that we can go and look at. And you will see there paintings of um, a bird's eye view of various towns, and you'll see the trees there, of course, 100 years earlier, but they're there. So you establish that your tree has cultural value, and then how do you protect it? So let me go back again to one of the most important things. Don't tell me I didn't put it in this. Um, every tree has cultural value. Think of it this way. Someone either planted that tree, i.e. a person, you and I, planted that tree, or someone made the decision not to cut it down. So. That's the research that has to be done to establish for the legislation that we have in Ontario whether that is a 
heritage tree or not. For other recognition programs, the tree just has to be really, really loved. But I have found in all the research that I've done is that you can find cultural significance in just about every big, old, beautiful tree in this province, especially southern Ontario, because someone either didn't cut it down because it was important, or someone planted it. And not just the Queen, in terms of the trees in front of the Parliament buildings, other places. So this is where we all fall asleep, okay? And I apologize for this. I do have interspersed with the various legislative levels of protecting trees, some examples that I was involved with, uh, in many cases intimately, and uh, so I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, by going through the process that I went through, you, you'll, you know, get a better feel for, for the legislative options. Anyone here not know what the Planning Act is? You know what official plans are, zoning bylaws? It's a piece of legislation that covers everything a private property owner and the public can do in the province. There are also a set of provincial policy statements that were just revised recently in 2014. They're very strong on protecting natural areas. They're very strong on protecting trees. But one of the first things the Planning Act says is that this legislation is there to look after the environment to create a healthy strong environment for the residents of Ontario. So, and then you, who, nobody reads legislation just for fun. Um, I did, I had to. I sat on the Ontario Municipal Board for a long time. It was a lot of sitting. <laughs> and so I did get to respect the legislation that we have, and it's actually very good. The problem is that nobody reads legislation recreationally, so nobody really knows the tools that we have that are available for protecting trees, and they're there. The official plan allows you to have policies that say heritage trees should be protected. The official plan probably says that you know natural areas of significance shall be protected, and in your community, in the schedules that are attached to the official plan of Gray County, there will be areas that are protected, designated as natural, to be protected, etc. And then there's an implementing zoning bylaw. Everyone's still awake? Yeah. Um, implementing zoning bylaw that actually zones those areas as open space, natural areas, green space, residential, R1, R2, industrial, etc. Okay? That's fundamental right across the province. The official plan, the OP, has to be updated every five years, and the bylaw has to be, comprehensive bylaw has to be updated. Because we're in a democracy, everyone has the right not to do what they want with their property. We have a totally different constitution from the United States. Ours, we do not have private property rights entrenched in our constitution. In 1981, there was a big battle, which I remember distinctly, because I was involved with it. We managed to keep out private property rights as being entrenched in the constitution, unlike the United States. So you have a right to ask to do what you want to do with your property, but you don't have a right to be granted that. It goes through a very public process. So even though your official plan says that something is protected, green space, if it's private property, the individual has the right to ask to do something else on that property, and it goes through a process. So that's why it's a good idea for groups to monitor what's going on in council meetings, attend public meetings when the official plan is presented, etc., to make sure the areas that you love and you feel should stay as green space do so. This is a case study, because this is, this, and this is an interesting one that I was involved with. There was a, a 1.3 acre plot of land, privately owned, and sorry, it was a three acre parcel, privately owned, and half of it was shag bark, hickory forest. It was designated natural area in the official plan. You know, technically, it was protected but it was privately owned and the landowner wanted to develop it. So 
So he put in an amendment to the official plan, and he also put in an amendment to the zoning bylaw to change the designation to residential. Now, there's a lot of writing here, but the long and the short of it is that the residents in the area wanted to see the woodlot protected as it was in the plan. They objected. The developer gave a little bit of wood leeway. He gave them a couple of trees, shifted the house away, and then took it to the council at a public meeting. It was a bad day. Nobody, barely anyone showed up, and the council ended up approving it. Because of the process that we have, one person, one tree hugger in particular, oh, and I should mention too that the developer did have an assessment done of the Shagbar Capri Woodlot, and it was deemed to be ailing. Okay. So that was part of the justification of wiping it out and putting townhouses in. So one individual was really upset. It's funny how it often is just takes one person, and she hammered and hammered. She tried to negotiate, and I was working with Evergreen at the time, and I got the phone call, and I said the only recourse you have is to appeal the um, decision of council to approve the application. So she coughed up her $100, and she appealed. And, um, oops, no, I'll stay on that then. Um, I didn't want it to go to a hearing. Uh, neither did the developer. That takes time. Scheduling a hearing, that takes lawyers, expenses, etc. So we ended up, she ended up negotiating with the developer. He ended up giving her the wood law. It required a reconfiguration of the townhouses, but he pulled them out of the woodlot, reconfigured them, and ended up losing, I think, only three townhouses just by giggling them in the existing space that didn't impact the woodlot. She saved that woodlot. They signed minutes of settlement, and everything was hunky dory. So, see the importance of actually knowing how the process works? She didn't realize that she could appeal. We have, a, I think it was 21 days. She was so upset when council made the decision, she phoned everybody. That was her recourse. She quickly put an appeal. It cost her $100. It cost her just several days of negotiating, um, but the success was, was incredible. And in the end, I mean, the, the developer doesn't lose that much because the property that's adjacent to a woodlot is worth so much more than the property that's just part of a subject. And I think that you know he knew that and was willing to, to negotiate as well. So that's that's the bottom of the pyramid. And the reason it's at the bottom is that it does protect land technically, but it's always subject to amendment. And sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Oh, I have another story when I sat on on the OMB. This is just a quickie. The developer the hearing came to me, and I looked at the file, and I thought, oh, this will be an hour max. It was in Ottawa. I drive down there. I walk into the room, and it was in the major council chambers, and there were 300 people there. And I thought, what did I miss in the file? I mean, it was a minor variance. He was asking for the yards to be a little bit smaller. And I walked in, and I thought, why are there 300 people here? And then it came out. This was an open field area that was always residential. All the developer was trying to do was to sort of maximize the number of units he was placing on in this property. But everyone had used it for walking their dogs or for nature or for, it was a beautiful piece of property. And there was this huge two to 300 year old maple tree right at the entrance to the, the field that was to be developed. The developer had cut down that field, that tree. But, and, and it was really an act of vandalism. It was just, I think, it, it was unpleasant. I, I, it was really, really unpleasant. I was shown pictures, I had people crying. That tree meant a lot to them, and it would have been just a beautiful entrance to the subdivision, but he or she decided to cut down the tree. And, uh, 
there wasn't anything I could do, um, except that normally, this is just inside me, how the OMB works. Normally, you had 300 people and their one issue was the tree. You listen to one person, you say, yes, you know, I understand everyone here is because of that. Well, the developer had, I think, three lawyers with him. And I made those lawyers sit and listen to 300 people. <laughs> tell them how much the tree was up to. <laughs> okay, so we also have another piece of legislation called the Municipal Act. And it's really, um, has a section 135 in which municipalities can pass, uh, local councils can pass tree bylaws. And this section of the Municipal Act allows municipalities to prohibit the destruction and injuring of trees. Okay, does anyone know whether Gray County or Gray has a tree bylaw? Yeah. yeah, okay, and does it prohibit the destruction and injuring of trees or is it a permit bylaw that requires you to acquire a permit for you? Okay. So it can be a very strong bylaw. It, it's as good as probably the fines that are associated with it. Um, not all municipalities actually have passed bylaws. This is a bit out of date. It's from the Ontario Woodlot Association. Uh, but the red one, the red sort of municipalities actually have uh, passed bylaws to prohibit destruction or injuring of trees. Um, many use it as a permit process in order to um, keep control of what's happening, but it doesn't actually meet the intent. Bylaws like that really are as good as their enforcement and their penalty provisions. So, now we get to some um, provisions that are available under the Ontario Heritage Act. I did work with the Ontario Heritage Trust for many years, and um, you have a number of options. One is listing. Uh, the Municipal Heritage Committee can recommend to council that certain properties be listed, and that can include uh, trees as well. Listing does not require the landowner's consent. Uh, it does, however, only protect the tree up to 60 days, but that could be enough. I don't want to sound like an activist. Don't quote me as an activist, but... <laughs> It could be enough to rally the troops. <laughs> so, okay, uh, this is just an example of a listed tree. It's a uh, Copper Beach in the town of Goderich. That's section 27 of the Ontario Heritage Act. And I will again say it does not require property owner's consent to be listed. Okay. Designation, I'm sure you've all heard of de uh, designating buildings. There are a number of trees that are designated as well that meet the heritage criteria of the regulations. And this is part four, section 29 of the Ontario Heritage Act. So just to sort of show you where it falls when you designate individual trees, that there are a few more than this. This table about two years ago. There are a few more individual trees have been designated. It's possible to do that, notwithstanding what your legal counsel might say to you. Um, and I do have a running battle with one municipality where the lawyer is absolutely convinced that trees can't be designated uh, because they're not cultural property, they're natural. That's not true. Um, there are hedges in LA, so a fact, a lilac hedge that has been uh, an, an Osage orange hedge edge that has been designated, but most of the trees that are designated are designated with a particular structure. They're designated by bylaw, so um, people like your municipal heritage committee or individuals who are specifically interested in heritage, we do some research and come up with a statement of significance. And um, what I've done here is I've just mapped <coughs> for you the uh, municipal municipalities and counties with designated trees. And you'll see that there is one in this area, in Washington, and I drove by it on the way here and said hi to the tree and took a few pictures. Um, and, and this is a trick question. This is, 
this is good. It's the Armstrong Big Playhouse. I'm sure you all have come by a million times. You probably didn't realize it was designated under Part 4, Section 29. And it also includes the pine tree in the northwest corner of the house. So I came by it hundreds of times, and I didn't know either. So this evening when I went, I looked at it. Okay, what's the trick question? Why? Sorry? Well, um, there's something tiny there, uh, but yeah, I looked at it and I thought, that's not a pine tree, that's a spruce tree. <laughs> and it is, it, it's kind of a blue spruce. So if I'd known that, I would have gone to look at the statement of significance. I was quoting actually from the designating bylaw. It actually says the pine tree at the northwest corner of the house. <laughs> and um, when I looked at it today, I thought, that's some pine tree. <laughs> <laughs> so can anyone enlighten me? No. Okay, I'll find out before November the 18th. <laughs> um, because for something like this, a statement of significance would be written, and it would talk about the history of the house, probably the features that needed to be preserved, who lived in it, um, their significance in the community, and when he planted that pine tree, or she planted that pine tree, and why it was important. Um, but it looked like a blue spruce to me. <laughs> anyway, that's the Hickman House. Beautiful, beautiful place. They're doing some work in the chimney. Um, this is the Mirror Maple. We all know about this tree. It's actually designated again under the Ontario Heritage Act, uh, Part 4, Section 29. It's on, it was, uh, in front of the house that Alexander Muir uh, lived in, a cottage actually, and there's the cottage in the background. The tree and the cottage are designated, and he, of course, was the uh, writer of the Maple Leaf Forever song. And it was thought that this tree might have been planted by him, or was the source of the leaf that came down that inspired that song. So um, it was designated in 1992, and then July 19, 2013, it came down with a crash and a sudden storm event. This is, this is important because this is one of the reasons trees, big old, beautiful trees, full of biodiversity, that define your community and tell you that people have been here for so long. That's why we are nervous about them. Um, municipalities sometimes feel uncomfortable um, designating them because events like this could happen. <coughs> this was one of those freak storm events. The tree came crashing down. And again, this was something that I was involved with. Again, you know, the beauty of an individual, a wood turner by the name of Michael Finkelstein, I'll give him all the credit, um, was going by in the streetcar, and he saw this, he hopped out, and he went ballistic. He knew the significance of the tree, he phoned the Prime Minister, <laughs> Mr. Harper, I don't think, was the least bit interested. Anyway, that didn't work. So he phoned the Premier, and then eventually he got down to me. <laughs> um, and he was going frantic because the city was in there with a wood chipper, and they were chipping it. And, uh, you know, it, it was gradually going. We managed to rally the troops. It ended up at this wood dump um, owned by the city. Uh, great portions of it saved, the, you know, the branch small branches and things actually were chipped. But um, he personally went out there, sealed the end so it would dry properly. And then in March of 2014, we had a huge event at Evergreen and the Brickworks in downtown Toronto. And they brought the tree from the log dump, the Wood Turners Association appeared. Uh, huge audience, we had pipe bands, we had a, a, a wonderful display of some of the pieces that um, Michael had actually made from the tree, and um, they turned it into a huge community event. The wood turners took pieces, um, there's now a mace, I think, in a parliament uh, in Ottawa of this tree. There are pieces that Ontario Heritage Trust that were donated several nesting bowls. It was, it was just very exciting. And there was a wonderful display in City Hall of all the objects that he came from, 
from the tree. Um, I was just so thrilled to be a part of that. Um, but my goal was to be the prime mover. So this is the tree as it now remains. Um, they didn't cut it down, they left the stump, and uh, uh, hopefully it will re-sprout. They were cutting some things, taking as well. This is interesting because this is the use of the Ontario Heritage Act, Part 5, which enables municipalities to designate heritage conservation districts. And so areas in Toronto, like the Harvard area, have been designated, and the trees are specifically mentioned in that designation, so they can't cut down. They're totally protected. Um, these are what you would call a cultural landscape, and uh, they define the character of an area, and they're um, as protected as you can get in Ontario uh, from being cut down. So now we get to some um, conceptually more difficult tools, but they still exist. Conservation easement agreements, and I just shorten it to easement here, is a contract between a landowner and an organization, charitable organization, that has the ability to hold easements. So that includes an Ontario Heritage Trust, it includes Ontario Nature, it includes the Escarpment Biosphere Conservancy that operates in this place, in this area, it includes Nature Conservancy, it includes a whole raft of organizations, either through the Ontario Heritage Act or the Conservation Land Act, that can sign agreements with landowners who want to preserve their trees. So, it's a good tool in that it keeps the property in private ownership, which is very important to a lot of people if they want to pass that on to their children or if they want to um, uh, sell the property, you know, to keep them in their old age or whatever. So it enables them to maintain their equity, but it also protects the trees through this agreement, which is mutually agreed upon and then registered on title. Not always um, the way the charitable organization wants to protect trees because the onus is on them then to monitor that conservation easement agreement over time, over generations of successive owners, all of who have less interest or stake in the property than the original person who, whose grandfather may have planted the trees or who saw those trees grow and their children hanging from the branches upside down and enjoying life. And that tree had emotional and, and uh, historical attachment uh, to them. So it becomes more difficult. So often um, the conservation organization, and Grace Sobel is another one that can hold easements as well, they'll often ask for an endowment or some sort of ability to have a bit of a cash flow to enable them to monitor that easement over successive owners. This is one of the few cases that I know of where an individual tree is passed, is protected by an easement agreement. And that was a project um, that I was involved with in British Columbia. It could have been here in Ontario, and I'm going to just spend a little bit of time with it because the Ontario uh, Planning Act and the British Col uh, BC Planning Act both require developers to dedicate parkland when they have a plan of subdivision. In, in British Columbia, it's 10% of the land that needs to be dedicated as, as a parkland. Um, in Ontario, it's 5%. There is a little provision in the Planning Act that enables your councils to accept cash in lieu of. So that happens quite often. and. That, uh, that cash in lieu is dedicated to recreational purposes. That's how you get yourself to fields and this, that, and the other thing. It's unfortunate, though, but in this case, this was a prime woodlot that was removed, and in the process, instead of doing a cash in lieu, when they removed the woodlot, there was this incredible red cedar growing out of two huge boulders. And it was going to get bull bulldozed down. 
three people, part of a Friends of Kennedy Park, they were determined to save this tree. If the municipality had just done a mini park, it would have saved so much time and effort. But they didn't want to look after a mini park. Um, and I think I tried to convince them that if they, it was too late by the time I got involved, but I did talk to council, I did talk to the planners. Um, I think if they had understood that Friends of Kennedy Park would be the long term stewards of that park in perpetuity, they might have bought the idea of taking that tree or that lot and turning it into a local park. But they didn't. But we continued to pressure them. So what they did agree to was to place an easement over the tree area, the rock, and the drift line. And it was registered on title, so whoever bought that lot was obligated to protect and steward the tree. So that meant watering and stuff. Now that's a proactive use of an easement. That not, doesn't often happen. In fact, it's the first time I've ever seen that happen. And then later on, they actually managed to get it designated by the Government of Canada, the National Historic Sites and Monuments Board. So it has national status, but that dedication, that designation does not actually protect it. It, was, it is the easement that actually protects that tree. That was how long, maybe three years of work for the Friends of Kennedy Park to get that ha to, to happen. But isn't that amazing? I mean, I'm, my hats go off to these people. The safest way of protecting trees is to have it, those, those uh, parcels of land, where they're located, owned by a conservation organization. And it doesn't have to be Gray Sobel, it could be Gray Sobel, it could be the Ontario Heritage Trust, it could be the Scarpa Biosphere Conservancy, it could be Ontario Nature. There are lots of charitable, registered charitable conservation organizations that um, make wonderful stewards and landowners. And here are a few of them. Gillies Grove in downtown Armprior, owned by the Nature Conservancy of Canada. Now, <laughs> I, th I think that they're in the process, when I was at the trust, they were in the process of trying to devolve that to uh, the municipality with the Ontario Heritage Trust holding an easement over it. It's a very high maintenance woodlot because it is downtown. And just a funny story, I'll have to. I went on a site visit with the NCC people, and there's a big sign saying, please keep on the trails, etc., etc. And as I walked through the park, it was filled with people walking their dogs and enjoying. The trees are fabulous. I mean, this is an old growth, one of the remnants of old growth sort of left in the Ottawa Valley. And I said to my colleague from NCC, I said, wow, you really trained these people well. Look at that. They stick to the paths. This is brilliant. And then I started to wander off to I realized it was absolutely thick with poison ivy. <laughs> 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 and they said, don't ever spray it. Native species. <laughs> but that's what kept you know, people out of the woodlot, damaging the early spring of petals and things like that. Um, just something to keep in mind. <laughs> anyway, this is in Java in Perth. That's owned by the Ontario Heritage Trust. And, and that's what we call a cultural heritage landscape. Um, there is actually an air photo of um, Perth, this part of Perth with Pinjava there. And these locusts, acacia trees, which surround the property are actually drawn into that map that dates from the 1880s. Uh, and one of the, my, in, in actual fact, the, the, um, the cultural landscape is really looked after by a wonderful group of uh, gardeners that uh, sort of formed the Friends of Injava and they maintain it. But one of the things I had to do when we lost a tree, uh, a branch fell, was to try and find a, a species that would fit in um, and be not quite as brittle as the locusts were that were there originally. And this is Fool's Paradise, another one of my favorite properties that uh, I was responsible for. And this was the home of Doris McCarthy called Fool's Paradise because when she bought it, her mother said, you must be a fool. 
to spend that kind of money for a place so far away from Toronto, and of course it's <laughs> in Scarborough, virtually downtown Toronto now. And that's one of Doris's pictures. She was a wonderful lady, lived to be 100. And uh, always, when we had doors open, she would always appear uh, until she was in her mid-90s. But this is one of her paintings of Fool's Paradise. And she's immortalized the trees. I mean, that is, that is the kind of documentation that makes those trees so important. One of them is a copper beech that was given to her by her students when uh, she retired from teaching. And so that's a very important part of the cultural landscape. So here they all are. These are all the ones I can think of. And, uh, you know, going from the Planning Act right to spending a lot of money or raising funds to buy land to make sure that those trees are protected. Um, anyone asleep yet? I'm just very quickly going to go through some of the recognition options that are available. None of these protect trees. Uh, I'm just going to show you the number that um, you can avail yourselves of if that is your, your inclination. And then I'm just going to spend two seconds on one that's very important. At the bottom is the Commemoration and Recognition Program of um, Trees Ontario, which is now called Forest Ontario. Okay, this is an online program. Uh, the site, you can just Google Forest Ontario, you'll see their um, Heritage Tree Program. If you click on that, you will find a synopsis of a lot more writing than, than you have in this, this presentation, but a good summary. I say it, I say it's good because I wrote it, but it, it is a, a written summary of the legislative options that I've talked about this evening, and uh, you can download that as a PDF. And there are a few copies that the museum kindly made for me for those people who don't access uh, the internet. Um, this is another handbook on heritage trees that Ontario Urban Forest Council put out with Trees Ontario. We came out with the first edition in 2006, um, and then we, because it just sold out like that, you're not alone. It, you know, it's incredible the number of people who feel very strongly about extraordinary trees. Um, <coughs> this has a, a good chapters on how to do the tree hunts. You've already done that, so you're well away to the races, and then there's a lot of stuff I wrote on legislative <laughs> options again. Um, the other one's a synopsis, so this is the detail. Okay. The other um, recognition programs are all at various levels of government. You know, with the top UNESCO World Heritage Site, uh, the Historic Sites and Monuments Board recommendation to the Government of Canada for designation. Again, not protecting it. Commemoration by the Ontario Heritage Trust Provincial Plaque Program. Uh, commemorated by your own municipal uh, recognition programs. I'd like to go back to the, the Forest Ontario Online Recognition Program very briefly. Something absolutely extraordinary happened in 2013. And I must have been sleeping at the switch because I really didn't know what happened until after it happened. And that is, the City of Toronto passed a bylaw, 248-2013, and it defined the heritage tree, and then it said, any tree recognized by the Forest Ontario Heritage Tree Recognition Program has the same status as a tree designated under the Ontario Heritage Act, Part 4, Section 29 designation. Can you imagine? <laughs> to do, to, to designate a tree, that's why there are only about 12 or 14 of them in the province, requires statement of significance, requires your municipality, to draft a bylaw and acquires, requires that to be posted for a public meeting, to get comments on it, to deal with any dissenting whatever on the bylaw, and if you're lucky, it'll pass, and then, you know, you're talking years, you're talking 
incredible dedication and a lot of money. Actually, it's quite smart of the city of Toronto. They dumped it all on Force Ontario's lab. So Force Ontario does have the criteria that I've talked about. It has to have, the tree has to have cultural significance. They do have arborists, and, and I review that. They do have arborists that will go out and have a look at the tree and make recommendations as to its uniqueness, its species, etc. We put the package together, and in the city of Toronto, if we agree, or Forest Ontario agrees, that it is a tree that it will recognize, it then cannot be cut down, no permit can be issued for its destruction. I, I, I'm holding my breath because I'm just working out for the city of, of, of Toronto what that means in terms of the paperwork. Now, who knows about this program? Not that many people who buy houses. So the moment that tree is recognized by Forest Ontario, something has to be registered on title of that property to say that that tree has got an encumbrance upon it and it cannot be cut down. That's probably enough to scare the crap out of most people anyway, and so there probably won't be a lot of people trying to protect those trees, but there are a significant number who do want to go through the process. We're just ironing that out now. And I just put it out there because I think this is an extremely innovative way of giving permanent protection to the trees, but sort of offloading that to an organization that specializes and has resources and is willing to go forward with that. So the city of Toronto has done it. Um, Rob Keane, who's the CEO of Forest Ontario, when he was contacted by the city, said, sure, it sounds like a great idea. Now, they had no idea what they were getting into, I don't think. We're just working and ironing it out now. But I think the process is going to be a good one, and I think it has a lot of potential. And you know, this is the new tool. I won't, I just described it to you. Um, if you want, you can actually find the bylaw online. Uh, you can also email, email me if you want details. There's my contact information. So thank you very much. I really hope you enjoyed this as much as I enjoy being with a group of people who are passionate about something that I'm passionate about. Thanks.